Um, and I want to tell this to all of the listeners, like you are not crazy for wanting to take that road less traveled by. In fact, it probably makes you the most sane. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This community is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those who dare to defy the status quo, step off the conveyor belt, and claim the best version of their life. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Welcome to the movement that is Successful Dropout. What is up, successful dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Jeff Hitner. Jeff leads Your Project X, which is a social venture dedicated to helping people rediscover their purpose to build careers they'll love. He has more than 18 years of experience as an entrepreneur, consultant, professor, and change maker. He's the founder of five social ventures, including IBM's corporate social responsibility consulting practice. Wow. Uh, And in 2011, he developed the curriculum for the first MBA in sustainability on the East Coast at Bard College, where he was the leadership professor. He was also two-time chairman of the Carnegie New Leaders at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Guys, I absolutely loved having Jeff on the show. He is the epitome of a successful dropout, and he's now using his experience to help other people step off the conveyor belt and explore uh, the world of possibilities. Um, <laughs> this guy, from, from an unconventional fifth year in college to moving to Boston, then Belgium, then Spain, being a strategy consultant, starting an internet company, as well as all the other things I just mentioned in the intro, um, uh, he's a social, he, he, he's an incredible social entrepreneur. Um, and he's just lived a, a life in pursuit of work he loves. And now he's helping you discover what you want to do, but more importantly, he's helping you discover who you want to be. So with that, uh, let's get to the show. I'm super stoked for this one, guys. That sounds good. All right. So, I mean, it's funny, um, you know, my opinions about like uh, formal education, informal education, you know, they kind of span two scenarios, right? Because um, um, I'm a lot older than I, I look, uh, at least <laughs> when people see me face to face. And so, you know, when I, w- I went to uh, William and Mary, which is actually a state school in Virginia, and when I was there, like it cost 15000 a year, right? And th- that was as an out-of-state resident. And, um, you know, um, meanwhile, my wife, uh, she to Fordham, uh, she grew up in New York City and went to Fordham. And, you know, we have an 11-month-old son, and we're still paying off my wife's college debt, right? Oh, and man. it's a really big difference between, like, you know, just, just in a few short years between her and I and our stories and, and, and that. But like for me, college is just like one of the many canvases that I use to get my education. Um, and for me, it was incredibly powerful. But um, I, I don't look at it as like the only canvas to start from, nor the only canvas that I used. So, you know, I was actually an elite gymnast uh, for 15 years um, and did gymnastics no all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I did it all the way through college. And um, one interesting thing was that like, um, and I think this is part of why I fit into like the original academic mold, which was that like, it created a very structured life for me. So it was like, go to school, come home, do homework for an hour or two, drive 30 minutes, go train and uh, do gymnastics for four hours. And that, and that, and, and half an hour home, I would be home at nine at night. This was like, six days a week, four hours of gymnastics every day, and then doing it in college. And, um, about like into my junior year uh, in college, I, I got an injury, um, just like a stress fracture, nothing like traumatic, but I had to have surgery. And I finally had this like long period of time, like literally like six months where I couldn't do gymnastics. 
And I suddenly realized I had been missing out on all these more informal parts of my education, just the stuff that happens sort of in between the lines, right? So what happens when you know, you're just hanging out with your friends, what happens when you explore new things you're curious about, what happens when, um, you know, after class, um, a bunch of you like continue the conversation about something that was really interesting. And what I actually ended up doing was, um, because I had, um, uh, been so badly injured with my, my fra- my wrist fracture, I had redshirted that year. So I had planned to come back for a fifth year, of college. And instead of actually doing gymnastics, I came back for a fifth year and I didn't do gymnastics. I essentially retired and declared that I was going to spend the year there, like learning about everything that I I had missed out on from having such a structured life. So in the, in a sense, like I was, um, for the first time sort of breaking free of like, this storyline of how structured like your day had to be with studying and, um, um, you know, going to class and doing these tests. And I didn't really need much class time to graduate. So I had this whole fifth year to explore. And that's why I, I like to talk about college for me as like a canvas. So I wrote for the school paper. I literally started an internet company. Um, I was in a school play. Um, I was, uh, like, uh, the social chair of my fraternity, um, you name it. My, my favorite, uh, the course that year was adventure games. Like you're, you're not talking about <laughs> like a heavy academic workload, right? right? But I can tell you without a doubt that I learned through more in that year than any, any year when I was taking, you know, a full semester or a full year of classes. And, you know, I'm trying to think about that, like in the context of, maybe some of the people that listen to this show, but also just in the context of, you know, what it means to get an education. And, and, you know, I think what it really comes down to is like our mindset, right? It comes down to what we're looking to grow and develop and, and learn about and what we're curious about. And, you know, I was still in school, so I used that backdrop to explore, but like it wasn't the classes, So, um, if I wasn't in school, if I was living in a, maybe a, like a, an urban environment or someplace where I could explore those similar curiosities, it probably would have worked in that context too. Um, but it really was about exploring like entrepreneurship, writing, um, just the world in general. And and by the way, just to put a little, put a perspective in this, this was like 1998, 1999. So, money grew on trees back then. This was like the (laughs) dot com boom. Right. So, right. So it's like you had an idea, like then you could go and start a business. And and basically that's what, that's what, what, uh, I did with some friends. Um, with the internet company. Yeah. 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 So we had started, um, you know, like we basically started the first online community on a college campus. Um, we called it the student information network. It was called sin. Um, and we ran like, like so basically camp- like Facebook got started. Yeah. We just like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was either seven years ahead or I really shouldn't give myself that much credit. Um, <laughs> it's one or the other, but yeah, I mean, we Let's give you the credit. We'll give you the yeah. credit. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it was really funny because so like after that, so after I graduated, I like I tried to get some funding for my internet company and that sort of fell through, but it didn't really matter. Like I said, this was when money grew on trees. So I just went to work for another internet company in Boston um, and basically just played around um, w- working on um, uh, internet communities, doing a lot of e-commerce build outs for college programs for like college uh, f- like focus companies. Um, and about two years into that, I was having a blast. I was living in Boston. Um, I just started getting this feeling like this sense in my head that I wasn't going to really ever feel comfortable about who I was in the world and like my opinions about things if I didn't see more of the world. Um, and so I actually called, uh, William and Mary, I called like their, study abroad office and was like, you know, I don't know if you get this call much, but I've already graduated and I really want to study abroad. 
because I, I hadn't been able to do that um, as a gymnast. Um, you like gymnastics is a year round sport, and I was doing it at a at an elite level, so there was just like no opportunity for that. And so um, this uh, professor at William Mary suggested a couple schools, and and one of them was called the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. And it's like the coolest stereotype of uh, what you would imagine when I say a 700-year-old university town. Oh, my like, gosh. There were two main plazas, and in one plaza, there were 36 bars. And literally, Dang. like, you know, it was like a, yeah, it was like a famous, uh, um, like, story. People would try to do a bar crawl around all 36, and of course, <laughs> you couldn't make it anywhere close. And also, Dude, I, know- I get that. We were just in uh, Ireland in a small town called Dingle uh, in Ireland. And it, just in that small town, small fishing town, there was 56 pubs. Mm. And we made it to 12, I think, in like three nights. But yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the way a lot of places are over there. Exactly, exactly. And, you know... I, I had been I had made this um, change, which was which took courage, like for anyone who decides to take like the path less traveled, mm. that's a courageous path, right? Um, and that can be anything from um, you know choosing not to go uh, to college to get the education you want to grow as a person um, to like studying in a different country. Right. And for me, it was leaving all my friends and family in Boston, um, which I knew down in my bones was something that I needed to become the person I wanted to be in the world. And so I actually arrived. This is another interesting little historical tid- tidbit. I arrived in Belgium in the university town on September 11th, 2001. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, so I couldn't have had a more distinct experience of seeing like seeing and experiencing the world and like the history that people in the US, while my friends were experiencing one way, I was experiencing it in a completely different way. I was experiencing it not around Americans. I was experiencing it in a setting with people from all different countries. Um, it was it was actually perfect. It was so beyond what I had hoped for, because like, again, was my focus about like the degree I was getting? No, I don't even think I mentioned to you what to be. It was, it was really about like being in this university town with people, like there were 66 people in my program and I was the only American. They were from all these other countries. Um, and I made friends from everywhere. And my education was about, um, like having dinners and coffees with folks literally every single day of the week. Um, I remember doing fun stuff where we would all write down on like a, on a beer coaster, what we thought was like the most quintessential like book that represented our country's culture. And like, we would all write (laughs) one down and then like share them as a group and then like try to read the, you know, the, the book from someone else's culture. Um, and you know, considering there are some folks there. Yeah, it was just, it was, it was awesome. And, you know, um, I think I talk about this a lot in the work that I do, but I think if you think back at different moments in your life, there are moments when you really feel like you're in flow when like what you're meant to be doing in that moment in the world is like dead on with, with your purpose. Mm. Right. Um, and that can be something like as simple as snowboarding and being like, Oh my God, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Or something that spans over a longer period of time. And for me, those longer periods of time was that like fifth year in college, but also that year in, in Belgium, because it was like, I knew that every experience I was having was a, a learning experience and it had nothing to do um, with being in the classroom. In fact, what was funny, most funny about um, uh, school, graduate school in Belgium was that um, each of the classes was basically like old school, like Europe style where it would be a lecture and like, honestly, the notes <laughs> looked like they were 10 years old. And then at the end of the semester, you would just write a paper and um, you know, uh, I was like, after maybe two weeks was like, I don't think I'll be attending class anymore. Uh, 
uh, I'll just be writing papers at the end of the semester. And I got a re- it got down to a really good process that I could write a really good paper in six days, like from checking the books out, because this is, again, back when you actually had to take books out of a library, yeah. to, uh, to, to writing it down. Um, and, and, you know, for me, all of my education was going to be in between that time. Um, and it was, and, and that was flow. But then what was so interesting with like being in flow and, um, feeling like you have purpose is that like, it's, it it can be transient. Um, and that's okay. So, and for me, I only know this looking back on it, but like, so after this year of graduate school in Belgium, like I wasn't done. Like I wasn't ready to come back home and like get some sort of quote unquote normal job. Like I still had more exploring to do. So, you know, I told my family like, you know what, I I think I'm going to move to Spain now um, and learn Spanish from scratch. And so I moved down to Spain um, and I lived for about a year in, in Granada, uh, which is in Andalusia in Southern Spain. Um, and I taught English in like the public school system and uh, did, did that like uh, with students after school, all sorts of a- a- ages from like five and six to uh, end of high school and then learn Spanish from scratch. <clears throat> and it was amazing. Like it was a whole nother <laughs> challenge. And for me, it was a whole nother education, right? It was like I literally could turn on the – so this is – Granada, by the way, is, is where um, tapas uh, were invented and where it's still free. So you go out to any bar um, and you can order a drink for like $1.50, whether it's a Coca-Cola or a glass of wine, and you get this huge plate of food that comes with it. Um, and it's it's just amazing. That sounds so good. Oh, it's so, so good. And, and um, you know, also there was siesta every day. So from two to five in the afternoon, everything was closed. <laughs> and like these things are like- So chill. Be- oh, yeah. so, so chill. And during those times are like the prime times for television. So um, like that's when the Simpsons would be on or that's when uh, they would have all these like news about like soccer because that's obviously big in Spain. And what was so cool is like it was education for me. It was quote unquote learning for me if I watched the Simpsons because (laughs) they would be in Spanish. They would use like colloquial expressions. And hey, I was trying to learn Spanish, right? You heard it here first, folks. The Simpsons (laughs) is educational. I love it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, you better believe it. It's also, uh, they, they apparently know the future. They can always predict future presidents. Oh, dude, yeah, I saw that. It was just, that's weird, you know, but, but yeah, yeah, it sounds weird. like you have to watch it in a different language, though, if you uh, get smarter watching it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and, and so for me, again, that was like a whole new situation. And yeah. like, I felt so alive all the time because I was always learning. I was always being challenged because I was Hmm. like trying to learn learn a new language from scratch. And then, you know, like a year went by and, um, it, I just like was so in touch with me because, um, I had given myself the chance, you know, not to be in like someone's forced box of how I'm supposed to learn and educate and grow Mm -hmm. that I felt like I really knew like what like I could hear my I could talk to myself in a way that was like I really knew what I needed to do next and something told me I needed to leave Spain um, partially because if, I think if I didn't leave then I wasn't ever going to leave I mean who's going to leave free food every day and <laughs> yeah. uh, siesta every afternoon but so I, I moved back to the states and I still didn't know what I wanted to do and so I was like all right well. What do a lot of people do when they don't know what they want to do? Maybe? Really quick, how old are you about right now? Uh, 25. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And I came back and I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll be a strategy consultant. That sounds cool. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah, and because I, I, I wanted to start a business at some point and mm. I um, just didn't know what. I didn't have like the, the business idea yet. So um, I thought strategy consulting would be a, another cool way to learn. So it was, again, like me taking my own sort of um, personal responsibility for what I wanted to learn and figuring out how I wanted to learn about it. Yep. Uh, and so that was the next model for me. And, um, you know, I, I ended up actually at IBM where I eventually uh, actually founded and, and led IBM's corporate social responsibility consulting practice globally um, <laughs> and was there for oh, a little over six years. 
um, and have been basically um, starting businesses ever since, mostly uh, as a social entrepreneur. So businesses that are really focused on having an impact. But what I what like so what's been so interesting for me is that only looking back can I tell you the, like the overarching thread that goes from like college. Um, a fifth year of college, moving to Boston, working in the internet, moving to Belgium, moving to Spain, um, starting a career as a strategy consultant, and then starting my entrepreneurial career. And it was that every time I got to that sort of fork in the road, where a lot of people say, like, uh, what, like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Or like, what's the right career decision for me? I always changed the question. For me, the question was not what I wanted to be in the world, but who. Mm. And if I could answer the question like who I wanted to be, what I wanted to grow as, like an individual, then the answer became a lot less stressful, like just a lot easier to prioritize. Because we're never going to know what's the right career decision for us. And like, if you're not sick of your grandmother or your aunt or your parents or whomever asking you <laughs> like what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> Well, you will be soon enough, but um, like, don't answer that question. Change it. Like, say, who do I want to be? Like, isn't it more important that like I solve that question? And, and when you solve that, the rest sort of just sort of falls into play. And for me, that's been such a powerful voice that that's now what I do for a living is I try to help other people figure out who they want to be when they grow up. Well, shoot, man, that. That's an incredible story so far. <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. It reminds me a lot of uh, my story as well as uh, several of the guests we've had on the show. Um, just sort of stepping out, you know, stepping off the conveyor belt, rather um, taking charge of your education, really pursuing the natural curiosities you have in that season of life, and and just seeing where it takes you. But that question at the end there, not what do I want to do, but who do I want to be. Um, I, I can tell you guys listening from personal experience that that was a, a huge pivot point for me, uh, it, as well. It was actually the, the season where I, I sat down and I wrote out, uh, my eulogy actually, um, yeah. might sound a little morbid, but it's such a powerful thing to sort of think towards the future. Um, you know, we're, we're all going to pass away. It's just, it's a fact, but what, what do you want people to say about, who you are and what kind of person you were. Um, you know, people could say all sorts of things about, you know, what you, what you did, but that doesn't seem to be quite as, as powerful as you're thinking about this, this stuff as, as who you were and the kind of person you were. And so I remember that helped me a lot too. That's a fantastic point, man. And, uh, I assume a question like that led to your project X. And I, I want you to share a little bit more about, that because uh, it seems really in line with a lot of the things we talk about on the show, and I'm just sort of surfing through your website as we're talking, and and I love what I'm I'm seeing. Um, you know, we're on a mission to reimagine the world of work. Uh, gone are the days of choosing one career path, one company, one role. This is great because just last night, um, successful dropout is is in the middle middle of we're developing a new uh, uh, website and platform for the community. And I was writing some copy on this very subject last night and talking about how how work and, and just the, the the landscape of employment and work is changing. Um, you can't like like your like your grandparents or parents did, you can't just pick or it's getting increasingly more difficult to pick just one skill, one career, and stick with that for 30, 40 years until you retire. Um, you've really got to be more adaptive than that. And so I'd love you to talk you know, to that a little bit more, what your project X is and sort of, you know, the, the genesis of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, and you hit r right on like one of the sort of like, um, what's the word, just like kind of symptoms of the big, mm. uh, problem or, or challenge that we have out there right now. So we've got young adults, let's call them like, you can call them millennials. And then we'll call like, say everyone under uh, 25 generation Z or whatever. Sure. <laughs> but um, millennials have already gone through the system, right? And they've come out and it's like, okay, well, we were just told to go get a college education. We were just told maybe even to go to grad school. And like, 
Now that even the industries that I'm specifically trained in don't exist anymore, <laughs> yeah. and, right? Like it's True. it's not even my skills. It's like the industry is gone. And if the industry isn't gone, the skills I need are changing faster than I could possibly like exactly. have developed. And and so what's been so interesting is you've got a whole group of adults, right? That um, first of all, aren't doing things that bring them any joy um, and are looking for a way to reconnect really with who they are. And so um, what what uh, your Project X does for that sort of demographic is we've built these two types of programs. One is what we're calling a purpose accelerator, which is, is, is kind of like a career change program. And that meets one night a week after work for anywhere from four to 10 weeks. And then we also do the same thing for an entrepreneurship program for people that want to be um, like launching their own ventures. And the reason we do it uh, after work is really very specific. Like one of the biggest obstacles to creating change in our life is fear, right? Fear of change and fear of the unknown. And we have this um, myth that like change is this huge leap. I promise you change is not a huge leap. Traumatic change could be a huge leap, <laughs> but the, the change that you are sort of directing should be in small steps. We tend to call them in your Project X micro experiments. And, and what that means is like don't quit your job if you have one um, to start to change your career or discover your purpose. We're going to help you do that while you're still working. So our program meets after work. And the same thing is true for being an entrepreneur. You know, a lot of people call it like your side hustle. There's no reason to uh, get rid of your uh, other income if you have one um, while you're starting the process of building your business. Because um, as I'm sure you know as well, building your business always takes longer than you imagine. And <laughs> no matter how rosy you put your financials together in an Excel spreadsheet, they never quite work out um, <laughs> like that from a time perspective. Very true. So, right. So we're about like small steps, micro experiments. And so um, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, that's all around like design thinking and human centered design and learning how to drive your idea um, from what we call an empathetic perspective. So really from a, a customer centered perspective where like they are literally um, creating your prototype for you and you are going back and forth with them to determine like what makes sense and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the, the purpose accelerator, it's really all about ensuring um, that like we give you the time and the opportunity and the um, uh and and like the setting to really dive deep into that question we talked about who you want to be in the world and both of these programs and actually all the programs that we do um are are kind of built around three core things and so the first is what i said micro experiments right that we take small steps every week and those small steps are always about engaging the world so it's funny when whenever I'm running a program, I always love to use this ex example as not a small step. Doing research, like updating your resume, those are not small steps. Those are not micro experiments. Those are you staying safe. Yeah. Like a micro experiment or a small step is you going out and having a coffee with someone in a new field that you're curious about. It's about you like launching mm. a meetup around like the your, your passion for baking bread and like having 10 people come to like your apartment for some sort of bread making thing. Like it's yes. literally getting yep. yourself out there. Right. Um, so that's the first piece. And then the second piece is community. And the reason community is so critical is for all the reasons we see like, uh, of our sort of, um, economic society, at least fragmenting, which is things are changing so fast uh, mm. The world is so unpredictable, it's so volatile, um, that we are not going to be able to thrive if we don't have a support system in place. And yeah. too many of us don't, or too many of us, our support system is very like um, linear. It's Maybe it's parents in, in you, or, or one friend in you, yeah. um, or, or a significant other in you. It, it needs to be a community. Uh, in the in the most beautiful sense of that word, right? So 
in our programs, like we build community um, where you are sharing like your deep, profound fears um, and you are working on them together and we are talking about them each week. Um, and that that is kind of a binding glue and a support network that you will have indefinitely. Hmm. Um, and then the third is um, also critical. It's, it's kind of inspiring um, mentors, right? Um, and, you know, part of that connects to the community, but definitely having them involved. Um, and then of course, like, um, uh, the, the, the growth mindset or like sort of the personal development that goes with all of those things. So those are, that's, what's kind of critical to our programs. Um, so those are the ones for adults and, um, about, um, let's see this is January. So about like seven months ago, seven or eight months ago, um, a good friend of mine, uh, his name's Greg Van Kirk. Uh, he's a very famous social entrepreneur, um, meaning he's been like recognized by the World Economic Forum as a social entrepreneur of the year. And he's even got a Wikipedia page around something <laughs> he created, which is called the micro consignment model. And basically he was in the Peace Corps in 2000 in Guatemala and um, was like trying to come up with different entrepreneurial ways to bring technologies into rural communities. Mm. And one of those ways he discovered was this idea of micro consignment. So an example was the cook stove. So a lot of impoverished people are doing cooking over an open like fire, um, which causes a lot of smoke and it's really bad for your health. So they would train female entrepreneurs to sell cook stoves into communities where like a cook stove is expensive um, uh, for you to run it as a business. You can't like buy this asset to sell. So what they he created was this micro consignment model where the cook stove was consigned to the entrepreneur. She would sell it to a family and just keep the profit. So she never had to go into debt. There was no like micro credit or micro finance involved. She was just consigned an asset in advance and she just kept the profit. Um, so anyway, that's just like a, a, a little side story on, on, uh, what, um, made him very innovative. And he does that with everything from cook stoves to glasses, to solar <laughs> technologies, to water filtration systems, you name it. I love that. Uh, yeah, it's very, he's, and he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. And so we got together like early last summer and he was like, Jeff, I've been running these programs for like college age students, bringing them down to Guatemala where I, you know, where we're doing all this development work. They, you know, they're there anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks and they're like actively doing the work there. Like they're uh, working in the communities doing, as I explained before, like design thinking where they're like figuring out what the challenge is in the community and then figuring out the technologies um, that might be able to support uh, or help with that challenge, but then they have to figure out like how the community would want to engage with that. Because too often we say, Oh, this technology will make your life better. But we don't think about how that technology changes culture or how it's not a priority for a family because mm. something else would be a priority. Yeah. So anyway, they, they, we had, he had all these uh, students down there, um, doing these incredible impactful work, uh, for two to eight weeks over the summer. And he's like, I think, like something that you're doing here in New York and something that I'm doing, like, let's come up with something together. And so we started thinking about what was really frustrating us. And, and this goes back to like college. And we were like, we are really frustrated that the predominance of focus at a university is around hard skills. So <laughs> like, yeah. you know, right. So hard skills, at least how we're defining it is, you know, related to um, learning how to code or learning how to do finance, right? Um, or learning how to do anything that, that is just very specific um, to a task. Yeah. Um, and we were frustrated by that for a couple of reasons. One, because a hard skill that you're paying forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for today is probably not going to be used in <laughs> five, five years. It's true, yeah. Right? And two, because there is... I, I can't tell you how much evidence out there from every single major company that the skills that they want mm -hmm. are not hard skills. Mm -hmm. They are looking for what we call soft skills 
or interpersonal skills more than anything else. So they want young people that can problem solve, that have deep, deep empathy, right? Yep. That have the ability to have a two-way powerful conversation with people not just that look like them or act like them, but are of completely different backgrounds and cultures, right? They want people with entrepreneurial skills, the types of skills that can say, okay, this is a like this is an obstacle, this is a constraint. Perfect. We love those. How do we work around constraints? Right? <laughs> and Preach it, dude. This is awesome. Right, yeah. And and yet none of these things are what are core to the curriculum of most universities. Right. There's some really cool exceptions, like one that I just learned about recently was Watson University. Um uh but for the most part, like the focus is on hard skills. And what was even more frustrating for us too was we did, of course, because it's what you should do if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, we did some focus groups before like we decided to launch a product together. So we started asking all these college students in New York, like, you know, what skills are most important for you to like get your first job and that sort of stuff. And they repeated the same skills that you would imagine they would re repeat because they're in the schools that they're in, right? So they were talking about, I need more skills around math or coding, or <laughs> I need more finance skills or that sort of thing. And what we, you know, what that made us realize is like, you know, they've, they've been told the story that's been going on for a very long time. Um, and it's an economic story, right? That's the one that drives you from high school into to college economic from the standpoint of like the colleges need to continue to get folks to attend too. Um, and they're trying to make changes, but they're, they're, there's not, they're just, they can't necessarily move as fast as, as, as some, some of us can outside of the system. And so what Greg and I decided to do is build something we call career X. And so this is the first, uh, multi-country internship and personalized leadership program that we know of. So um, we, we work with students, again, similar to our other programs, around their schedule. So we meet uh, one Sunday a month, um, and we train them on these core skills we were just talking about, design thinking, empathy, um, social entrepreneurship. We, we do a lot of work around purpose as well and, and values, right? And then we take them to Guatemala for 10 days. And in Guatemala, they do this amazing work. They get to basically get the experience that most adults don't get until like 10 years into their career. So you're going to mm -hmm. consult um, for like uh, small organizations and family-run businesses uh, in really rural communities. And you're going to do it from such an empathetic perspective that you will be staying in homestays at the same sort of like uh, impoverished uh, level as the people that live in that village because we're not huh. going to create solutions for people living in our ivory tower, right? So a really cool example of, of how that sort of lesson um, or experience uh, becomes a reality is we visited one really interesting organization called Maya Petal uh, in uh, Antigua, Guatemala, and they make – they turn like um, bikes into really cool – sort of um, appliances, like kitchen appliances, everything from blenders to, um, uh, well, you name it. To, uh, yeah, they can do all sorts of cool stuff. And, um, you know, the students thought it was thought it was fantastic. And then we, um, you know, we spent another night in our home states. And I said, okay, what what perspective do you have now that you've stayed in their home, your home stay? And one young woman, uh, I'll never forget it. She was like, you know what, like, the home I'm staying in is so small, like there's no way this bike will like, no matter how cool this, this idea is, this, there's no way it'll work in this house. And I was like, bingo, <laughs> that is the, ex like that only comes from the experience of walking in the shoes of the people you're trying to support. So like, that's why we try to get people to really understand what it means to be empathetic and to, to live with the people that you're trying to, to collaborate with. So we spend 10 days with these students in, in Guatemala. And when we come back, uh, something that's been ongoing with them since before we go to Guatemala, and then when we come back is they're also, uh, they work in teams to solve a wicked challenge in New York City. And they determine what that challenge is as a group.
Um, and in fact, the, some of the experience they get in Guatemala will be around with organizations that are focused on a similar topic so they can see how organizations in Guatemala are addressing a similar challenge. Mm. Um, and then when they come back here, they continue to work on it. And then we're guiding them um, as, you know, like more experienced uh, mentors that, that support them. And then we also have mentors all across New York City that we connect them with on a weekly basis. And for us, the whole idea is like, we, we, we often joke about it. Maybe we should put it on our website. Like there are no textbooks in our program. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is all experiential. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, as a result, like, you know, we do micro experiments with them each Sunday that they get together with us. We, really sort of fun, creative things to get them out of their comfort zone and, and understand more of the design thinking process. Um, and we do that like every Sunday when we're with them. And then the other thing that we wanted to build into this program in particular is that we see lots of people, as I'm sure a lot of listeners, and I'm sure you as well, like you go and you travel, right? You have a pretty phenomenal experience when you travel in it and it can be yeah. very transformational, right? But you come back and there's no structure around it when you come back. And this is the one time where I want a little structure. When I say structure, I mean around reflection. Mm. Like you're just like, whoa, I just had this like amazing month traveling. I don't know where. I was in Thailand or I was in um, Colombia or I was who knows, right? Or I was in Spain. And you come back and you you don't really have anyone to like connect with uh, around that experience. And so we wanted to put that travel component in the middle so that when they come back, we can have a very structured reflection or <clears throat> excuse me, reflection around it hmm. and really get to the heart of like what, like that experience, like how it impacted you, what, what you felt, what you saw, what was different and like how that might change how you think about things and continue again that process of of building the person in terms of who they want to be in the world and not what. Um, so yes, yeah, so that that's our like my, that's our current like new program, and we um, just came back from Guatemala with our first cohort of of young people. Oh, we right had, on. Yeah, we had fourteen uh, uh, university students uh, from New York, and we, we took them to Guatemala, and and now we're actually about to launch a spring program because that that one's going so well so the spring program uh, is going to take the students during their spring break uh to guatemala um and you know our our dream is to grow this um both beyond the the, the schools we're doing it with in new york city um to several other cities and then um, to have one that's sort of a mix of virtual New York City and Guatemala, so you don't even have to be in school mm, to, to participate. Okay. Yeah, because that was my next question: is this all sounds so amazing, but it sounds like it's really localized there in New York, and and so you do have plans to expand that a little more, maybe do something online or totally. I mean, so part of uh, we tr we try to like uh, practice what we preach, and so we're big into prototypes. So. Yeah. Right. So this is our prototype. This is our pilot. So, um, of course, like particularly because of how much amazing feedback we've gotten from our participants. I mean, really amazing feedback. We want to do this in as many places as possible. So we just again, going back to what I was saying about what a, an entrepreneur does is they find they see the constraints and then they just have to figure out how to get around them. So our, our constraint is, well, we can't be in so many places at once, right? So like if we bring this to Boston or if we bring this to DC or if we bring this to anyone anywhere, what has to change for it to uh, one, um, accommodate that, but then also to ensure the same quality, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's just stuff where we're trying to figure out. So one of the ideas we're experimenting with is like a virtual one um, where you know we'll do like the first several meetups um, online together and then we'll probably all meet up in New York for like an intense like several days and then fly down to Guatemala and then come mm. back. So to be determined is uh, – the, <laughs> but the design is it's, – it's in our heads and it's percolating. Is there, is there any way currently that say uh, – because we have a lot of listeners I know, for example, in California. Is there any way that somebody in California right now could get involved with your Project X in any way, shape, or form or, or uh, 
maybe is there just an email list they can sign up for to stay up to date with when, when you might be able to reach them? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, visit our site, so yourprojectx.com, and just sign up, um, put in your email address, um, and you know, feel free to check out some of the programs too. But as we figure out how to be more virtual um, and how to run programs that aren't just local, um, we'll be communicating that to um, like the community of folks that are, are getting our newsletter and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. Because I think what you're doing now that you've described it in, in great detail, it's just it's so phenomenal. And I think w- what you're doing is so important um, in the midst of this, this massive shift that, you know, honestly, it's kind of still hard for me to, to, to prove to some people, but this massive shift that's happening in the way we approach education, uh, building a career, you know, a a job, entrepreneurship, building a business, um, relating to other cultures all around the world and stuff. Now that we're so much more, uh, we can be so much more connected. Um, I just think what you're doing is, is really important. So, we want to be able to support you, you know, with that. And what what successful dropout is is, you know, you were just talking about the importance of community, and what we've become is a real is a is a, a haven for people that really want to think outside and, and act outside the box. And um, <laughs> this isn't this isn't the things you've been talking about. This isn't a philosophy that's really widely accepted yet. And so we have a lot of listeners, for example, that are really. Uh, really isolated in their current communities, and so there needs to be a, a space, uh, for instance, online where they can connect with with peers. Um, you know, we talk a lot about you know you're the average of the five people you hang around the most, and so what successful dropout is really becoming is a community of people searching for solutions like this, and uh, we want to be able to to connect our our community with individuals like yourself and Grant Schroll and and so many others that have come on the show. I think that's so important, um, and I can't tell you how much, as per, particularly as someone who mentors folks too, just how you're right, how important it is to hear that. Um, and I want to tell this to all of the listeners: like, you are not crazy for yeah. wanting to take that road less traveled by. In fact, it probably makes you the most sane person there because it means you're listening to your like sort of inner voice that yes. says no. I need to do it differently in order to be a like truly connected, happy, like fulfilled person. And it's the people that like decide that they want to ignore that inner voice and and get brainwashed by the system um, that's going to lead them down a longer path of challenges. Um, and um, you know, we we have that economics that stands in our way because we um, all think that like we need to have this. 30 year job. Uh, but that story is, is disappearing bef- before our eyes. And mm. so the, when, when, at the end of the day, when you're left with like being challenged, maybe jumping from one job to another, every couple of years, the thing that's going to, um, keep you happy no matter what is that like, you're doing what makes you happy. Like <laughs> you, you're connected to who you are and what your purpose is. Um, and you have a meaningful community around you. Um, and those should be your priorities. And if they are like, uh, I'll bet on you any day of the week, um, <laughs> any day of the week. So word, man, that's so, ah, such good stuff. One question I, I had for you, Jeff, that I feel like you, you probably have some experience with and, and can definitely shed some light on, um, one, uh, there's a question we get a lot uh, in the community, and it's from individuals that have made this decision to to think differently, to step off the conveyor belt and and start to explore different options um, than what's just sort of handed to them. And uh, but but the question that they often have is they have so many different uh, curiosities or interests in the moment. Um, they can't decide which one to pursue first or which one they feel like is, is quote unquote, you know, the one, uh, there's a lot of pressure as I'm sure, you know, and have experienced yourself. I, I remember back when I was, uh, you know, 18, 19, um, a lot of pressure to sort of pick one career path or one, uh, set of, of say skills and, and stick with that, you know, for a while, because you, you feel like you need to succeed in the short term, you know, you feel like by the, by the time you're, you're 25 years old, you should, 
you know, have have a house and maybe a decent car and and a, a decent salary and be sort of moving your way up the up the the ladder, um, or else you you know if you don't succeed in the short term, you're you're probably going to be judged by a lot of your family members or or, or peers. So I, that all stacks up, and there's this pressure to then you know figure out what you're going to do with your life when you're when you're so young. Um, and so people that are sort of trying to step out of that mentality, they're looking at all these different options. They have a lot of different interests and they don't want to, there's this, uh, there's this natural feeling that arises that you just don't want to waste time pursuing things that you're not going to be focusing on long term, Right. But you just finished talking about, uh, you know, a, a lot around exploration, how important that is. So I'd be, I'd be curious to hear what advice you have for listeners who are, sort of coming up against that dilemma. They have a lot of interests, a lot of natural uh, curiosities that they want to pursue, but they're not sure which to do first. And there's sort of that, uh, that sure. fear there. Yeah. I mean, I think it would come back to what I was talking about at, at the beginning of our, our conversation, which is about reframing the question, right? So you got lots of different curiosities first of all that's awesome right that's a good problem to have Mm -hmm. um so but reframe reframe the question like which one do i pursue now to make use of like x y and z like job opportunity no reframe the question as um how do i want to grow right now what what is like the most important aspect of me and who i want to become um that needs um that needs like cultivating that needs um experience that needs um some time to uh, really be discovered more deeply focus on the question from that perspective because you will absolutely pull your hair out if you're trying to determine which of your curiosities is the right way to go from the standpoint of uh like career because one you're never really going to know because like i said industries, careers, all that's like all those skills change so fast, but also because that's not really like where you're stuck. I think, I think where you're stuck is like, which of these is going to make me like truly know more about myself, which of them is truly going to make me go in six months. Wow. Like now that I have that, like I can go do the next thing. So, so really base it around your personal development, especially if you're 18 or 19 or 20, like, trust me in the world that that's, um, appearing before our eyes, like you are not behind whatever traditional sense of that word is. You are not behind anyone else. If like you haven't had a a job for three years or a skill that, you know, is paying a hundred thousand dollars by the time you're 25, because I'm sure there's some, uh, person that did pursue that skill, that job that got them a 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollar job at 25. And guess what? It just got automated and turned into an artificial intelligence job. (laughs) And now they are so far behind you because you at least know who you want to be in the world you know what your values are. You know what's important to you. Um, and this other person is scrambling. They have no job, which tied them to like their sense of themselves, and they don't know those things about themselves. Um, so it's really, it's like all about developing the you first. Yeah, and in addition to that, you'll you'll probably have picked up on a lot more of these soft skills that that Jeff was talking about as well, which will just aid you in finding the next thing or or connecting to the next uh, individual or or group of people um, that could really excel your your career, as opposed to somebody who's really just focused on the hard skills. Um, it it leaves a lot to be lacking when you're you're very focused on hard skills and then you all of a sudden have to start adapting to a rapidly changing world. Uh, that's where those soft skills really come in handy. Um, Jeff, yep. I'm I, I'm curious. Uh, what what would you tell if you had ten minutes in front of your eighteen year old self? What would you tell him right now? Uh, oh, actually, that's pretty easy. Um, I would tell him to quit gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, um, that goes back to that story around like structure and, um, yeah. you know, like, uh, just kind of, uh, in being in like this automated mode. Um, 
I've gotten, it's, it's kind of a paradox. I've gotten a lot out of that, uh, being, uh, a gymnast, my, my whole sort of first half of my life. Um, but it, um, blocked my curiosities, my opportunity mm. to explore other things. So, um, for me, it would have been about, um, I guess telling what I've been telling, you know, sort of everyone on this podcast, which is like, um, listen to yourself and start the exploration when, when, um, when you're ready, when you're hearing it from, from within, because I basically did as a young adult, what, uh, I think people could be doing when they're, they're 18 or 19. Like I'm such a big fan of the gap year and a mm-hmm. lot more people mm-hmm. do it in Europe than, than do it in the U S and it's becoming more and more talked about here in the U S. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, cause I, you know, I basically, went and lived abroad for three years, um, you know, for graduate school and then in Spain. And, and that was the exploration that I needed to have done like four or five years earlier. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. There's a, it brings to mind, we have several stories from the community of, of people doing this now, but it brings to mind uh, one individual and I won't say his name, but I know he's a listener from India. I've done a lot of corresponding with him and stuff and sort of followed his journey. He was uh, one of the, one of the first uh, several listeners, I think way back in the podcast and we've still kept in touch. And uh, we had this, this conversation. He was in a very structured environment. He felt trapped and boxed in and really just wanted to cut loose and pursue some of these curiosities and, uh, I remember talking to him and, and we've, we kind of talked about sort of taking more of these baby steps. And, um, after that, I remember the, the next day he had started a YouTube channel and he'd done a vlog about his day where he just, he just took off and climbed a mountain, uh, somewhere and like had this so incredible cool. experience and vlogged about it. And, um, you know, he didn't, didn't really know how to do, you know, for instance, video editing or set up a YouTube channel or anything like that. So, you know, he had to learn that hard skill or those hard skills in the process. But, you know, also we were just chatting and he was just talking about how that one small experience just kind of walking out his his front door, you know, it was in his his area and just just climbing a mountain for the for the day, you know, taking off from the, the regular schedule and just sort of exploring, you know, it was physical exploring. It was um, but but uh, it, it seemed to really help him get out of this this mentality and get into this new mentality. Um, and, and now uh, he's doing some really cool things and he started some uh, great sort of side projects and hustles and he's going to do really well. But um, lots of cool stories from the community like that. Anyways, Jeff, and, I w- go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's funny because that's kind of an activity we do in, in our uh, Purpose Accelerator program is, is hmm. essentially go go wine and dine yourself is what we call it. Like go – spend an hour and a half wandering around um, and see where your feet take you and see where like your heart and mind takes you. Um, You know, we do this in New York city, right? So it's a little bit um, more urban when we say that, but it could work anywhere. Um, So I just, I thought of that when you talked about like he went and like explored and climbed a mountain, like there's, those are the the best ways to get in touch with Hmm. that curious self. Um, And sometimes we, we, we need, we need that change of scenery or that permission um, to just go and explore what's on our mind. We need something physical like that. I feel like sometimes that that breaks this these mental filters that that we sort of set up and to sort of break out of these mental boxes and and view the world in a from a different perspective. Some of the some of the speaking of climbing mountains and stuff. I know some of the biggest epiphanies I've had in life. The uh, big, the, the, the most clear decisions I've made when I've come to, uh, different, uh, roadblocks or, you know, splitting into, into two paths in my life have been when I'll take like a, a journal or something. I, I, when I was, uh, you know, 18, 19 years old, I'd jump into a, my 99 Honda Accord and just like drive and I'd find a trail or a, a mountain somewhere and just climb it, spend some time sitting on top and just sort of free journaling, you know, not about any yeah. particular subject, but out of that came so many deep realizations about myself, what I wanted to do, uh, who I wanted to be. There were even times I remember I'd get up at, uh, this might be a little weird. I'd get up at, at midnight, uh, and just, I would take <laughs> off into the woods. I'd start a little campfire and just, and just sit there for like a couple hours. 
um, just completely surrounded by nobody and, and darkness and just alone, you know, with myself, but doing something that was really out of the norm, like who, you know, who, who does that? Um, and, and also, you know, you're a little bit out of your comfort zone. You're out in the middle of nowhere. It's scary. It's at night that I'm not saying that if you're listening, you have to do this particular thing, but it was, uh, it was, I look back now, I didn't think much of it then. I was just like, this is kind of weird, but this is what I feel like doing. But I look back now and I think it was out of this desperation to just experience something different and like break this this mentality uh in this box that I, you know, felt like I was I was in at the time. And it did it did wonders. And so even just things like that. Totally. That makes total sense. Yeah. But anyways, Jeff, we're coming down to the end of our time here. I've I've really enjoyed this and I've loved getting a, a an overview of what you're about and your story and everything. I'm thinking if you're down in the in the near to mid future, we might uh, need to have you on the show again and go like really deep into some particular topics because I think I think our listeners would love it. Um, but I do have two more questions for you before I let you go. I try to ask these of every guest um, because it's what a lot of our, our listeners are dealing with right now. Um, but the first one is just: Do you have any parting advice? for any of our listeners who are uh, in school or in some sort of formal schooling, schooling environment and they're thinking of dropping out um, because they're just they're fed up with it for whatever reason, they don't feel like it's right, but they haven't quite made that step yet. What, what parting advice would you have for that individual? Uh, maybe this would be conservative, but my parting advice would be um, – uh, Make sure you talk to someone that that is giving you the that non stay in school perspective, mm. um, and so you know because I'm sure it'll be easy, particularly uh, on uh, at a university or if it's in high school to get um, you know advice of why you should stay in school, uh, and and you know universities are are overwhelmed with um, that advice giving to folks. What you need is to have a conversation with someone that cares a bit more about hearing your personal story um, and is willing to like consider um, advice that's outside the box. So I guess what I'm saying is um, be conscientious of the people you're um, getting some mentoring from um, if you're thinking about making a decision like that. Um, be really conscientious about like um, – you know, their view of the world and their view of the system and their view of you um, and try to get a diversity of opinion um, mm. and definitely get people's opinion. Um, no matter how clearly you think um, you're hearing your voice, um, it's always, always helpful to bounce your thoughts off of others. Yes, yes, love it. And, and on the flip side, man, what parting advice do you have for any of our listeners who've already dropped out and who are already on their uh, we'll say entrepreneurial sort of self discover uh, discovering journey. I think for the, for you all, like welcome and um, <laughs> make sure this is the the dorkiness in me. Make sure you understand design thinking. It is such an important part of being entrepreneurial and figuring out how to create prototypes and experiments and empathize and. Um, really build stuff that other people um, are craving. Um, and make sure, as I was saying with the other uh, question that, that you asked, is make sure that you have a community of support around you. Mm. Being an entrepreneur can be really lonely. Um, it can be really scary. Um, it's a type of uh, stress and challenges that um, you know too few people have experience with. So try to surround yourself with other people that are in that same boat. And if you can't find them in your physical community, you can most definitely find them online. And if you can't find them online, you can find them in me. So feel free to reach out to me. <laughs> which leads perfectly to my next question, which is what is the best way that people can connect with you? Yeah, very easy. Just email me at jeff at yourprojectx.com. Awesome. Well, successful dropouts, you are the average of the five people you hang around the most, and you've been hanging out with Jeff and Kylan today, learning what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Jeff into the search bar, and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish.